Uh, really honored to, to be here today, and, and want to kind of put some things out there first before we start talking, uh, just to kind of understand a little bit about my background and, and why I wrote this book. Um, the first thing I'll tell you about the book, the original title was Good is Not Enough and Other Unwritten Rules for Young Professionals. Uh, and I wrote the book because I came of age, like I said, in, in the 1960s. I was born when Eisenhower was president. Uh, I've had this AARP card a whole lot of years now. I'm much closer to 60 than anything else, Grandpa. But when I came of age, there were not a lot of women and people of color in leadership positions. And the few that were there had this attitude of, hey, I got mine, you get yours, college boy. Uh, and so I said, if I ever got to any level of significance in corporate America, uh, I would give back. So I write this book, and I take it to the publisher, and they said, Keith, it's a great book but no one knows you outside of the diversity and inclusion space, so rewrite it and call it Good is Not Enough and the Other Unwritten Rules for Minority Professionals. I said all that to say the concepts I talk about today are for everybody. Uh, it was more of a marketing ploy that they made me change the name of it, so I uh, understand this, this is for everybody. The second thing is, I don't care who it is, no one rises to the cop of any organization without someone who's already on the other side who looks down, sees your value, and help pulls you through. I don't care how they, how, who they are, from President Obama to you know, the president of, of you know, Dr. Pepper Snapple. I mean, someone had to help them, and it's about people. And never, ever forget that. Uh, and so we'll talk a little bit more. Uh, but again, that's why I wrote the book, because again, uh, I grew up in Cleveland, inner city of Cleveland. Anybody from Ohio? Oh, what parts? Cleveland. Cleveland, OK. So you, you born and raised? No. OK. But anyway, I grew up in the inner city of Cleveland. Uh, and we, were, we weren't poor, we were poor, because, you know, poor is like, you know, P-O-O-R. We were poor, P-O, we couldn't afford to own the R's. <laughs> and, and when you grow up like I did, it's all about success, and it's all about stuff, right? You know, and so my thing was I'll get a degree, I'll go to school, I'll work, and I'll, I'll buy things. And I had an epiphany in about 2005, I was living here in Colleyville at the time, senior vice president for Pitney Bowes, and my best friend from high school passed away. But on his deathbed, he said, Keith, promise me, that you'll do something significant. I'm like, what do you mean? You know, he says, we had a lot of stuff. We got the big houses, the big cars, all that stuff. He says, I'm about to die, and all this stuff means nothing. And I thought about that because at the time I had four kids. They were teenagers then, uh, two girls, two boys. And I said, if I die today, my sons are going to fight over my car collection, <laughs> dummies. My daughters will fight over the property. That's smart assets that go up in value. Uh, but what will I have done differently? So really, that's where this whole thing came from. And so you know, let me share a little bit about my journey and the lessons I learned. I speak a lot to kids in high school, college, uh, and young professionals. And when people see me, you know, when they Google me, this is the stuff you see, right? You know, on television, CNN, da da da, you know. And they think that you know, I, I started that way. You, know, you must have been you know, brilliant from day one, yada. Not at all. And so I have to remind them. But before I even remind them, let me take you back a little bit. Do, do, do you, this was a, a magazine for black enterprise. you recognize anybody in that picture? <laughs> Other than the guy who's 10 years younger and 15 pounds heavier? See Dina in the corner there? Dina, Dina was working for me at the time, and I was, they, they did a story of me about mentoring. And my thing is, I'm not going to take a picture about mentoring without two of my protégés in there. And so uh, that's Dina Rembert and Curtis Jacobs, the back of his head, two of my most successful protégés. So I say that. But again, people think I've been successful. Now, brace yourself. <laughs> Let me take you back. The year was 1978. I was rocking a crooked Michael Jackson afro, a little bit Michael Jackson, Steve Urkel. Um, kind of look going. <laughs> uh, but I was editor of the Black Student newspaper, The Vindicator. You know, 1978, some of you probably weren't even born yet. Um, but, but that's how I started out. Funny looking. You might say, well, that hadn't changed much. But, 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 but that's me. And so I was at a school recently, and they said, Keith, if you could go back and talk to your 20-something self, what would you say? And I said, the first thing I would say is you got to have faith. Faith in yourself. Faith that you can get it done. Faith for me in a higher power that when I don't think I can make it, I can. But you're going to need faith along this journey, young man. Secondly, I would say focus. One of the things that I attribute to my success, even in college, I was always focused. Uh, anybody familiar with, with sort of sororities and fraternities? And the, so I was an Omega Psi Phi. Uh, if you know anything about that, we have a nickname that's not very flattering, Q-Dogs. Uh, I went to every party on campus. The reason I graduated is because I was focused and knew when to leave the party. 
I knew I had a final exam the next day or a midterm. And so focus. When I got into corporate America, I said, you know what? I can't do all these other things. I can't sell Amway on Tuesday and play basketball on Wednesday and bowl on Thursday. I've got to be focused. And I would tell that young man to stay focused. The other thing I would say is fortitude. You are going to be challenged in your career. You are going to be pushed. You're going to be told no. And you can't just give up at the first sign of any type of pushback. Again, I have four kids ages 27 to 30, and they're millennials, and I may see a few millennials in the room. Uh, and they struggle sometimes when they get pushed back. You gotta fight through that. Fortitude, you gotta have it. Fearlessness, you can't be afraid. Uh, one of the things I see a lot of people struggle with is afraid of relocation. People are comfortable. So when I talk to young professionals, I said, look, it's table stakes. If you want your career to advance, you have got to understand and be willing to go and live and do things and, and go places you may not want to go. I wasn't thrilled in 1986 when they said, we got a great promotion for you and it's in Detroit, Michigan. <laughs> and my wife looked at me and said, see you on weekends. Uh, it means not being afraid to do different things. I went from sales to customer service, tried different things. Be fearless. And then last but not least in my world favor, I have gotten positions and promotions that I really wasn't ready for when I got them. It was just God's mercy and favor on my life. And so uh, I would share that to that young man. But we're talking about diversity and inclusion. And, and let me first say for everybody in this room, I define diversity a little different. Most people, when you think diversity, they think of gender, race. No. To me, true diversity is diversity of thought. And companies and people who are serious about diversity look at it and say, I want diverse opinions in the room. And so if I do that, then by nature, I have to have different people, genders, what have you. So that's it. The second thing is you hear this thing about diversity and inclusion, right? I love diversity and inclusion, but I don't think it goes far enough. And here's my analogy. To me, diversity says you get invited to the party. Inclusion says you get a seat at the table. But there's this third piece called equality that says you get the same opportunity to succeed as everyone else. Now, what you do with that opportunity is up to you. But you have to have that opportunity to succeed. I went to my marketing people and said, hey, I want, I want to coin that. And they said, hey, Keith, that's die, D-I-E. I don't think that'd be a good, good phrase for you to, to market. And so I left that alone. But the fact of the matter is we live in a very diverse world, very diverse society. Uh, and so diversity is no longer the nice thing to do. When I was coming along, you know, it was the nice, you know, equal opportunity, affirmative action, you know, quotas. No, 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 no. Diversity is a business thing. I was in the grocery business, and what made me be successful was that I understood that I had 120 stores that were in different neighborhoods, and I couldn't merchandise them all the same because the way they ate in the kosher community and the way they ate in the Latino community and the way they ate in the African-American community and the way they ate in the African community was totally different. And so we merchandised the store for the community. Diversity is about a bottom line. It's not white. It's not red. It's not yellow. It's really about green. Companies who don't get this, here's what they struggle with. Increased turnover, people leave. You know, you can have a great brand as a company. You can get people to come to your company. You know, if you have a great brand, can you keep them? Morale changes. You go from a high pole. What's a high? You guys, you high potential, high pole. You know, someone who's that you a lot of potential. If you're not careful, you go to a popo. Uh, now, for those of you in a certain part of Dallas, popo is not the police. <laughs> it is passed over and pissed off. Have you ever had that in your career where you, you've been passed over by someone that really you knew you had better skills, more qualified, and you get passed over, you get pissed off? Disengage. I don't know about you, but if I'm not valued, or, I don't stay anywhere I'm not valued or appreciated. Job, relationship, anything. Friendship, you know. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, I just don't. You know, increased recruiting costs. I hear all the time. I consult Keith. We keep, we keep hiring them. They won't stay. And I'm like, well, what are you doing to help them stay? I mean, you know, it's, it's, so it's, it's really those things that make people really value and say, hey, is diversity really worth it? There's an organization called the Executive Leadership Council. Uh, you may or may not be aware of it. It's made of the highest ranking African and African American leaders in the country. People like Ken Chenault, people like Ursula Burns, people like Don Thompson, uh, people like Keith White. Uh, you can only be two to three levels from the CEO. It's the creme de la creme, so to speak. And we said, hey, let's help this next generation understand what's important to be successful. So we took a survey of ourselves, and we agreed that these four leadership skills were, were number one, communication, leadership, executive presence, team building. 
We said 98% of us agree that ambition, hard work, and you know, that, and that's important because I got millennials. And well, I love my children, but they were that Nintendo instant generation. They got everything. You know, when I ran track in high school, it could be 20 people in the race, it was three medals. First place, second place, third place. When I played basketball, it was 12 of us on the team. The five or six that could play, played. All right? My boys come up, 10 people in the race, 10 people get a trophy. 10 people get a ribbon. Basketball game, every kid has to play a certain amount of minutes. That's not real life. And so my oldest daughter, she's 30 now. She had her first job out of college. And, you know, six months later, Daddy, I should be a VP by now. Excuse me? You just figured out where the bathroom is. You know, and then my other daughter, when she got her MBA, she lost her mind. I have an MBA. I, you know. I said, sweetheart, your MBA only tells me two things about you, that you're ambitious and you're educable. At the end of the day, you've got to put in the time. You've got to put in the hard work. You've got to make it happen. And, and so these are some of the skill sets that, again, we said you have to have. Conversely, when careers kind of fall off, when you become that popo, when you come passed over and pissed off, there's a place called the Center for Creative Leadership. And they say that when your career messes up, when you fall off track, these are typically the reasons why. First, difficulty of changing and adapting. If you missed the memo that we live in an ever-changing world, it's already late, too late for you. Just, just, just go somewhere and sit down. It's over. The second problem with interpersonal relationships. It took me a number of years to realize that I don't come to work to make friends. I want to be friendly, but I got to work with people I don't like, people don't like me, and I got to separate that because it's not about me being your friend and being your buddy. And sometimes people have a hard time with that. People have a hard time dealing with people who are different than they are. You got to get through that. Failure to build and lead a team. They made the mistake at AT&T of making me a manager at 25 years old. I had the head knowledge. I didn't have the skill, the wisdom. And I went in there, you know, my whole 150 town self pulling up my britches. I'm the boss. And I learned the hard way. Those, those guys, you know, these are, these are guys repairmen. You know, they, they smack, look, little boy, you know. And I had to learn the hard way that you have to create fathership. Your title doesn't make you a leader. It may make you a boss. It doesn't make you a leader. Failure to meet business objectives. If there's the one thing that you say, Keith, what's the toughest conversations you've had to have throughout your whole career with people? It's that one. Did you get the job done? Did you, you were given goals. You were given objections, objectives. It's the end of the year. Did you meet them? And people want to tell me about how hard they worked how many hours they put in, how much effort they gave. And you get to a point as a leader where you say, I appreciate your effort. I pay you for results. When I go before Wall Street analysts to talk about quarterly earnings, I can't talk about the effort. The stock price will rise and fall on the results. And too often, I see professionals who don't really manage the results piece of it. And we'll talk a lot more about that because I've seen more of them fall. And then the last one is too narrow a functional orientation. Sometimes you can antiquate yourself out of a job by staying in one spot too long. So my master's degree is in systems programming. I can program in COBOL, Fortran, and C++. For anybody who knows anything about programming, those are dead programming languages. <laughs> and the only place that still uses them is the IRS. <laughs> and for about a month, Obamacare, but they switched out. But uh, <laughs> Had I stayed in that track and in that skill set, I would not have advanced. And so sometimes, you know, you, you need to broaden your perspective, broaden your horizon. So, so those are the career derailment factors. I am asked all the time. Uh, I was on a show with the Essence Magazine people, and they said, Keith, who has it harder and tougher in corporate America, women or men? And they expected me to say, well, men, of course. Um, there's an organization called Catalyst. How many women are familiar with the Catalyst organization? If you are not, you should be. It's an organization uh, that's really focused on advancing women in the workplace, uh, making sure there's equal fairness, equal pay, those types of things. And they say that there are additional challenges women face uh, that men don't face as much, and I agree with them. The first one is lack of significant P&L or responsibility. What does that mean? Not given the opportunity to really run the business, to make it succeed or fail, and be responsible for the results of that division. Uh, typically, sometimes women, they want to shoe you in departments that are more staff-oriented or things that don't have quantifiable. And, and, and the reason that's important is because results talk. If you have results for this business unit and you earn and you show that you exceed, it's easier to say and quantify your values. That's the first thing. Second thing, 
I call it the good old boys club. How many people think the good old boys club is dead? <laughs> Smart crowd. Now let me ask you a different question. How many people think it's intentional? Let me, my dad was a preacher, let me testify and confess. I was guilty at my career at one point of creating a good old boys club and I didn't even realize I was doing it. Let me tell you how I did it. Now I was living here in Colleyville, so I'll blame Texas. But at Pitney Bowes, we had this event every year for our top performers. And we'd take them to Cancun or Hawaii or somewhere real nice. Uh, and it was a mix of work and play, right? And on play day, I decided in my infinite wisdom that what I would do is for the women there, I would give them three spa treatments on the company of their choice and that the guys would go play golf, okay? Uh, and I went and I did that, and about a week later, I get a call from a lady named Jonna Torson, who was our senior VP of HR, and she said, come see me. It's kind of like when the principal says, come see me. She says, I got a problem with what you did in Cancun. So I'm like, wait, I didn't do anything. And she says, the day that you had the event, you had men play golf, and you had the women go to the spa. I'm like, yeah, women were high-fiving me. They loved it. You know, they had manicure, pedicure. She says, here's the problem with that. So say, Ron, you played golf with me and Lane and somebody else, right? We played 18 rounds, holes of bad golf. We went, smoked cigars, 19th hole, got to know each other. Your name, young lady? Yolanda. Yolanda goes to the spa. She gets a manicure, pedicure, you know, I, she snuck in a massage on me. I mean, she, <laughs> here's the problem with that. Six months later, there is a job that they are both interviewing for. They're both equally qualified. And Lane and I are the decision makers. Guess who has a leg up in that scenario? Ron. So I created this good old boys network without realizing it. So she said, from now on, you got to let people self-select what they want to do. And I said, you know what, that's great, because my golf game is horrible. So you know, from now on, I'm going to be at the spot getting my eyebrows done. I mean, you know. <laughs> but, that, but that was a way where I was not intentionally setting up a good old boys network, but I really was. you know. Uh, and so we had to change that. Stereotypes, this is one that's tough. Again, I got two daughters in corporate America, and, and confidence on a leader looks good on a man. Okay, w people love confident leaders and strong leaders, on, you know, swag, as my grandson says. Um, but when a woman does it, it takes a different turn. So one of the greatest female leaders I, I know was Mag Margaret Thatcher. What was her nickname? The Iron Lady. Think about that. And, and so it's one of those things where women have to kind of balance this femininity on one hand, but you can't be too soft because then, you know, and so I think, again, stereotypes you have to deal with. Failure for senior leadership to assume accountability. One of the things that I have to tell you, you know, a, a little secret about old men <laughs> is that when you get older in your career, you want to reinvent yourself. So you look for a little young buck. Well, Ron, you ain't that young no more. Um, <laughs> You look like a young fellow like him, you know. And you say, let me take you under my wing. Let me show you some stuff. Let me do different things. Uh, and, and we do that. As men, we tend not to do that to women for a lot of reasons. You know, we don't, it, the optics on it. And so women don't always get that subliminal coaching that, you know, let's go have a drink after work coaching for men. The other thing, and women do not throw tomatoes at me, I have observed in my experience, is sometimes women don't even do that for other women. You can have senior leader women who are like not helping other women. I'm sure that does not happen here, but I'm just saying I've gone to places <laughs> where that happens. And then the last one is really illegal, and that's bias towards uh, personal family. Uh, I've been in situations where I'm in a room with HR people and, and business leaders, and there's a promotion, and they think about Yolanda, and they say, well, didn't she just get married? I'm like, yeah, what's that guy doing anything? Well, you know, she may want to start a family. And I, well, did, did she specifically say she didn't want to relocate because she was, well, no, no. Well, you can't assume that. And oh, by the way, that's illegal. And, and so women, I think, have some just challenges. But I believe that women bring some unique skill sets in the workforce that men can't even begin to compete with. So first of all, I think women are more intuitive. And, and how that plays out to me in corporate America is I will always make sure when I did strategy, planning, marketing, that I had a female perspective in the room. Any married men in here? Any men in relationships? Have you ever, like, told your wife or your woman you're going to do one thing, but you really were going to do something else, and she knew? And you go, how'd she know? <laughs> intuitive, intuitive, intuitive. <laughs> oh, I'm the only one. <laughs> okay, put me out. Okay, all right. I got caught. Uh, more flexible. 
I have found that men, we, we are just Neanderthals. We, you know, my granddaddy did it this way, my daddy did it this way, I did it this way. And what I find in corporate America, women are more flexible and they understand that the way I manage you and the way I manage you has to be totally different because of your skill sets. Um, better communicators. <laughs> I don't think there's a man in here who would, would, would disagree. I, th- I, I agree women are better communicators. And the way I really see it play out uh, is when it comes down to giving and receiving feedback. Uh, I, I see a lot of that. The problem is you pick the wrong time to communicate. So the middle of the Super Bowl <laughs> and May 2nd for the Pacquiao fight and May, is not the time to have a conversation about what color carpet should we get. You know, so so you got to pick it. So I think, again, women bring a lot to the table. 